Ladies and gentlemen, how are you? John Miller here, Iowa everywhere, doing a little house cleaning here. Wasn't wasn't sure if we were going to go live tonight because I quite frankly wasn't sure how this game was going to go. More on that here in a second. But first, we want to thank our friends, our presenting sponsor, Wild Rose Casinos in uh, Jefferson, Emmitsburg, and Clinton, Iowa, three locations across the state, the state to take care of you. Me and Willie and Van Winks and even Aiden, who's along the way tonight. We got to get out there, play a little blackjack, and we will do that at some point in time. So thank you to uh, Wild Rose Casinos in Jefferson, Emmitsburg, and Clinton. Iowa, 94, LSU, 87, and I am stunned in the best of ways. I feel um, – I just feel so much energy flowing through me. It was so much fun to watch that. Um before the game, I had some friends saying, actually, last night, this morning, hey, what would you play if you were going to play this? I said, I'm not going to play this because I can't, I, I don't want to have money on one team and rooting for another because I said I'd probably take, I'd probably take LSU on the money line. Um, watched a lot of LSU this year. We all watched LSU against Iowa last year in the national championship game. We saw what Angel Reese, what Flo J. Johnson, what their size, their physicality was able to do, really knock Iowa out of their game. And I say this, um, we always get on the officials when they don't do uh, a good job, at least relative to our view of what a good job is and what isn't. For me in basketball, I just want to see the game be played the way that the rules are written up. And by and large in this game, this was a very well officiated game. The officials set the tone early. And actually, I think more so than the officials setting the tone early, LSU and Iowa both came out and they put their talents on display. This wasn't a basket brawl. This wasn't uh, mucking it up like we saw again against Iowa and West Virginia. This was amazing skill. Amazing talent, amazing athleticism with some of the best call, women's college basketball players in the country and some of the best ever on display, allowed to let their skill shine. And there was no shine on the officials. That's the first thing right off the top. And that's what you want to have. You wanted to see something like this. I don't know that this game's going to hit 10 million, uh, you know, over 11, 12 million at its peak, like it did last year in the national championship game. The national championship game was played on a Sunday. It was also on ABC, but it was also in the afternoon. Monday night, ESPN, this thing is going to easily do an eight or nine. I, I think it'll do at least eight million. I thought it could do double digits. Maybe it could, because honestly, my timeline, and I saw Aaron White, former Iowa basketball player Aaron White, tweet this out. My entire who I follow timeline was talking about this game. And of course, a lot of those people are Iowa fans or Iowa media, but you know, it was just amazing to see Kansas City sports talk people I follow tweeting about it. Nick Wright, who's now an incredible national talk show host, formerly of Kansas City, he's tweeting about it. Celebrities tweeting about it. Um, oh, I can't, what, what's the guy, uh, Aiden, help me out here. This is probably going to be the first pick of the Chicago Bears, won the Heisman Trophy for USC. I am not, Caleb. Uh, Caleb Williams. Caleb Williams. I couldn't get Williams. He's tweeting about it. I mean, who wasn't watching this game? And why not? We just Okay, where do I start? I, I need to get my mind around this chronologically. Caton came out firing, just like she did against LSU in the national championship game last year. That was en route to her hitting nine of 20 three-point shots. They put LSU put Haley Van Lith on her to start. I thought Haley Van Lith was going mothballed to the end of the bench for the entire game. Quite frankly, I'm surprised uh, Van Lith played as much as she did. Caitlin Clark used and abused her badly. Uh, and, and really, it's not that any other LSU player really had an opportunity, but a key point Put Flo J. Johnson on Caitlin, but you can't because Flo J. Was, had some couple of fouls early in the game, and they didn't want probably to take up that much energy from her on the defensive end because she's an incredible offensive player. But Flo J. Uh, in this game, she did get 23, but she didn't really have that Flo J. breakthrough. She's a phenomenal player, uh, probably the second best player on the court 
a be, you know, either her or, or Angel Reese. Flo J is is phenomenal, going to be an incredible pro. But I, I think, kept her in check. You know, Angel Reese in this game, 17 points, 20 rebounds. But did they keep her in check? They did after Addison O'Grady was put in the game because Hannah Stolke had foul trouble. And Addison O'Grady came in and did an incredible job against Angel Reese. I mean, seriously, you look at Addison O'Grady's stat line, um, no points, no re- – if, if this ESPN stat line is to be believed because, of, unfortunately, the NCAA doesn't allow us to access the same stats that we can access all year long. Uh, she had – she was 0 for 1 from the floor. Uh, oh, look at old Aiden coming in off the bench. I love this. So go over here to Addison O'Grady. Uh, and you see five points. Okay, five points. Thank you, because ESPN's thing sucked. Um, five points, two of five, four boards. I'm telling you what, the defensive effort that she did on Angel Reese, and it was as much keeping Angel Reese from getting to the spot that she wanted to get to on the block, pushing her a little farther out than that block down low, which meant like a seven or eight foot area to post up. That's a whole different game to someone that is used to operating on the block from about six, four feet in. It's a whole different game. Addison O'Grady, hat tip to you. Don't like to do that too much with the thinning here, but Addison, it's the best I can give for you right here. Fantastic, amazing support role effort. And one of the efforts that sprung Iowa to win this game. Don't ever, ever forget Addison O'Grady's contributions in this game because they were incredible also um kate uh, caitlin clark 41 points i mean just when you think you've run out of superlatives for her nine of 20 from three as iowa 13 of 31 as a team from three uh just an absolutely incredible night for her another double double for her she scored the most points i think now in ncaa history or ncaa tournament history she's now she's the all-time leader in three-point field goals made in a career i don't know that there's going to be any offensive uh, records other than rebounds that she's not going to have rebounds and steals. Just, just stellar. Sydney uh, Fulter in the first half, she, she helped. She was tag teaming with Caitlin, keeping Iowa um, in this mix last year at halftime. It was a double digit deficit for Iowa. This year it was 45 to 45. Uh, just an incredible display. And uh, Sydney Fulter just has elevated her game late this season, Big Ten tournament, NCAA tournament, incredible game from her, 16 points and five rebounds, as those of you who are watching this live can see there. Um, those of you listening to this, I'm saying it out loud, so that's why we're doing it. 40 minutes also for both Gabby and Caitlin, Kate Martin with 38, Sydney Fulter with 37. Kate Martin did Kate Martin things. The fadeaway she hit on the left side in the middle of the fourth quarter, I think to take the lead either from six to eight or back from eight to 10 uh, was incredible. That's not something that she normally does, but she's just tough as nails. Um, Her rebounding in this game in the second half, she had a few uh, key boards there, six total for the game. But Kate Martin did Kate Martin things. So did Gabby Marshall. Gabby Marshall hit uh, her only shot of the game was a three-pointer, and it was early, and it was so big. I think it was part of that 17-5 lead that Iowa had at one point in time. And then LSU came back, and they led by eight, and Iowa erased that. And then we get to halftime, and it's all square, 45-45 going into just 20 more minutes. Caitlin Clark saying before this tournament, we're only guaranteed 40 more minutes. We got to do that six times, and uh, I'll get back to the big picture stuff um, here in a second. Aiden, could you go to a split box for me real quick um, on this, just to kind of compare? Because the rebounding advantage that LSU had was amazing, and I want to look to see inside here. So yeah, over on that right side, if you want to blow that up a little bit more, um, if that's possible, might not be. There you go. Um, yeah. So scroll back to the top for a second. So we've got uh, LSU shooting shooting thirty nine percent, eighty eight shot attempts. There's your, re- you don't even need to go down to the rebounding line. 88 shot attempts. They made two more field goals than did Iowa, and they shot 19 more shots. Iowa at 46% from three. That's the difference in the game. Iowa 13 of 31, LSU 8 of 24. 
LSU also missing some free throws. Uh, turnovers were even. Points off turnovers, though, Iowa exacted more. Scroll down, if you will, a little bit. Total rebounds, 54 to 36 in the offensive glass. You don't win games when you are minus 17 in the offensive glass. Now, LSU did beat Iowa 14 to 5 in second chance points, but when you juxtapose what Iowa did 16 to 5 in points off turnovers, negated. Negated it right there. I, I'm still stunned. 88 shot attempts in one game. LSU was six blocks to I was three. Both teams with um with six steals. Um tied four times. Uh you know, okay. Thank you. You you can take the stats off now. Thank you. I appreciate that. Aiden kicking some tail here for me um while I collect my thoughts because now getting into the macro, well, not quite the macro yet. Coaching job, Lisa Bluter and Iowa made some fantastic adjustments in this game. They went zone after a bit, which I thought that they would in this game, and was concerned rebounding out of a zone, not the easiest thing to do for a team that maybe doesn't play a lot of zone. And you saw that. We saw that in the rebounding disadvantage for Iowa. But it def LSU wasn't shooting well. They didn't start shooting well to start the game. Um, and Iowa took advantage of that. And, and really, with the exception of maybe a 10-0 run in there, uh, LSU just didn't shoot it all that great in this game. Gabby Marshall's, I, I think so many players played great defense. Uh, Caitlin Clark actually played really great SAG help defense in the lane to make it tough for Angel Reese. Angel Reese, it's still again 17 and 20. Uh, she did foul out, but the Iowa coaches, I thought, did a fantastic job. Kim Mulkey could not find an answer for Caitlin Clark. Didn't matter if it was Haley Van Litt, didn't matter if it was somebody else. Um, I think it was Poa maybe that was trying as well. And it just didn't matter because Caitlin Clark, here's one thing I'm glad I remembered. I'm glad I've talked myself into this. Those of you that have watched Caitlin Clark play a lot, she's a very emotional person. And I don't, I don't use that in the pejorative. She is passionate. She is competitive. That's what emotion looks like. It comes from a fire and a competitiveness. Now, have, have I criticized Caitlin for whining too much to officials during her career? Absolutely, I have, and, I, and I'll stand by it. What you didn't see tonight, very often, maybe a couple of times, was Caitlin going too hard at the officials. I've never seen Caitlin Clark play a more composed, emotional game in her Iowa career. This was by far and away the most emotionally composed she was and has been in Iowa. And again, don't, don't mishear me here. When I use the term emotional, it's passion and competitiveness coming out. It's not how misogynists use the term emotional when referring to a woman. To me, Caitlin is just, she can't hold it in. She just wants to win so bad. And I said, the, the players that she reminds me of, the players that she reminds me of are Michael Jordan and Kobe Bryant. Michael Jordan would want to rip your heart out on a Wednesday night in February after the All-Star break. Games that most NBA players are just clocking through, not Jordan. He'd figure out a way to, you know, pretend that Craig Elo some, you know, crapped in his Cheerios or something and go out and lay 50 on him in a Wednesday night in February when nobody cares. But Michael cares. Caitlin cares. I've just never seen that type of killer instinct. Kobe, MJ, and Caitlin. I'm sure other people have had it too. Those are the ones that come to mind for me. And an unbelievable for someone to harness that fire and, and keep it under wraps, keep it smoldering, but still let it fuel you, but not let it just come out. That's what you're going to see at the next level with Caitlin. You're not going to see the, the complaining to the refs and things like you're going to see Caitlin more under composure. I hope that this is an object lesson for her that just takes her to even another level, if that's even possible. I was trading texts with my friend Scott during the game. And he's like, John, has there ever been an Iowa athlete? I'm going to just read what he says because I think it's an interesting question to ponder. He said, is Caitlin Clark the most dominant Iowa student athlete ever as far as impact and skill? And as far as my lifetime of watching Iowa sports, it's I don't even have to hesitate, of course, with space. Now, I didn't see Niall Kinnick play. I didn't see anybody play really before 1979. But in my lifetime of over 40 years of watching Iowa athletics incredibly closely, Caitlin Clark is one of one. She is just clearly the best offensive player in the history of women's college basketball. I mean, the numbers back it up. We all know the numbers. 
Now on the macro, back to back final fours. Even if you are one of the best four teams in the country, that is not a given. In women's basketball, yes, I hear some of it. In women's basketball, it has definitely been a blue blood made uh, made program sport. When I say made program, thinking of like you know a, a a godfather. He's a made man. You know, you had Tennessee, you had UConn, you had just the you know the perennial blue bloods, Stanford of the sport. And it's really it was really hard for other programs to break into that stratosphere. I used to get so frustrated looking at the women's uh, AP voting on a week to week basis. It was just like it's the same people every week, even if they lose, they, they maybe would move one or two spots to go to back to back final force. And again, Caitlin won't be there anymore after this year. But to take this program on a visible platform, the way that the Iowa women's program has been these past four years, but certainly these past two is unfathomable. I never in a million years would have thought something like this would have been possible at Iowa. Now, of course, you have the greatest offensive player in history playing for you. It helps. She would have done that for a lot of programs, but Lisa Bluter didn't just get here. She's been here. Lisa Bluter has been around the block. Lisa Bluter is one of the most respected respected coaches in NCAA history. Lisa Bluter is 10th all-time, the 10th all-time winningest coach in women's basketball history. She's the all-time winningest coach, I believe, in Big Ten history, Big Ten women's basketball history. So Lisa's been here, and I always had some really good teams before and really good players before, but Caitlin Clark's one of one. The run that Iowa has been on these past two years, now going to the Final Four for a second time in a row, that puts you into a different stratosphere as a program. Iowa already picking up a commitment uh, a few weeks ago from one of the top 15 players in the class of 2025, happens to be a point guard, plays and lives in California. How's that happen, a little, little Iowa? I think you're going to see more and more of that. I don't think that this is the end for Iowa. I think they'll struggle to, you know, I don't think they'll get back to a Final Four next year, but I didn't think they were going to get to a Final Four this year. Before the season started, there was a uh, – was it Shimmy, um, former Michigan State player that said she she had Iowa fifth place in the, her Big Ten standings? And I kind of understood it, even though it was a hot take and certainly received a lot of clap back from Iowa fans. Hello, Hawkeyes. Um, but I understood it because I felt that the loss of Monica Cesano was going to be too much for this program to overcome to get back to a Final Four. And even in getting to a Final Four, again, it's not a given. I mean, Iowa lost to Creighton and Iowa City in the round of 32 a couple, like, was it three seasons ago now? Caitlin's sophomore year. That never should have happened. Think Weird things happen in March. Even if you have one of the four best teams, you are not guaranteed that you're going to make it to the Final Four. And Iowa all season long just went out and proved me wrong in so many different ways, and they proved me wrong again today. Don't get me wrong. I was rooting hard for them every step of the way, all season long. I wanted to be wrong, and I was, and I'm glad that I was wrong. And Monica Sassano was, what, one of, you know, three or four, maybe five at most, 2,000-point scores in Iowa women bas women's basketball history. She might have been just as efficient, if not more efficient, as her senior year than Megan Gustafson was the year she won National Player of the Year relative to, um, you know, shooting nearly 70% from the floor, not taking dribbles. I mean, just an incredible, I just didn't think Iowa could overcome that. And I felt that Hannah Stolke was probably going to struggle to, you know, play with that intensity up her game that way just because of her temperament. I, I didn't know she had it in her. Hannah Stolke came back in this game tonight in the second half after she was kind of abused by Angel Reese in the first half. She was banging. She was getting down there. She wasn't letting Angel Reese establish that low block position, the same that we saw from Addison O'Grady. She did it at least on two occasions late in the game while the game was still in doubt. So um, when it mattered, Hannah got a mean on, and she delivered. It was an unbelievable team contribution and team effort for these Iowa Hawkeyes. And um, it doesn't hurt to go to back-to-back -back Final Fours. Uh, I wonder how many women's programs have done that. It might be like 10 just because, again, like we talked about before. But um, in the last 25 years, I, I, I'll tell you this, in the next 10 years and beyond, 
you're not going to see that happen a ton. You're not. South Carolina's on an unbelievable roll. Uh, you know, UConn is, has an opportunity after we do this live to get back to another uh, Final Four and Sweet 16s for them is, you know, a thing. Um, USC making it back to a Final Four for the first time in over 30 years. Juju Watkins, an incredible, incredible player. Average the second most points in the country this year behind Caitlin Clark. Um, you know, and if she stays all four years, who knows? Maybe she'll challenge some of Caitlin's records. The reason why I don't think you're going to see things like this happen a ton or certainly with the frequency they have in the past going forward with women's basketball is because this sport has arrived. This sport on a national basis has arrived. The TV ratings numbers during this NCAA tournament, and I'm talking about games that don't also don't involve Iowa, have been record-breaking, record-breaking. The, the, the world is getting an opportunity to see how entertaining women's basketball is at a high level. And there are many of you that were here a long time ago. Hats off to you too. Um, but it's, I think a lot of people are here now. Again, this, this, this will probably, this will be the most watched non-final four game ever. I think Iowa's win against West Virginia had that title. Iowa just broke it here. There was, what, over 6 million viewers at peak for the Iowa-West Virginia women's game in a round of 32 game? Are you serious? Um, and I believe that was also on cable. Um, it's here. I think Caitlin Clark has helped get women's basketball to a bit of a ubiquitous status, and that is you don't have to make excuses Oh, I don't really watch the women's game, or right? they don't play. They don't play for. They don't. It's not fun. It's below. It's, uh... No, those days are over. And if you want to continue going forward with those, then you're just a Neanderthal troll because the women can bring it. They can bring it. You saw so many exceptional, talented, brilliant women at their peak tonight in this game. You watch UConn tonight against USC. You're going to see more of it. I'm going right to watch it after we're done with this, which we're almost done. Um, congrats, Iowa. 94-87 win against LSU going back to another Final Four. Aiden, any thoughts? I got a question for you. Yes. So tonight's ESPN lineup, you know, we get LSU, Iowa, Caitlin, um, Angel Reese. Right. Into Juju Watkins and Paige Beckers. Yeah. When was the last time the men's game had a lineup like that on any given night? It's a great question. Um, that is, I mean, I'm sure I, I couldn't tell you the last time it's happened. This is what you're saying. It, this is elite. This is incredible. Yeah, it's, um, it's unlike any sport right now. Yeah, it's and right now in terms of star power, when you talk about college basketball stars, we list off the names of four five, six women really before we get to any men's name there. The at least two women on this court, Caitlin Clark and Angel Reese tonight have more name recognition and name star power than any men's player in the country this year. And Juju Watkins and Paige Beckers, same. There's four mm -hmm. right there. All right. And and you could probably go a little deeper than that. I mean, Flo J maybe maybe doesn't have the the national notoriety for the casuals. She but the people that watch the sport know that she should be right there. But yeah, that's a great point. Uh that puts an exclamation point on what I was saying. The women's game has arrived. And just so you all know, I, I invited Aiden to be a part of this tonight, but he just wanted to let me flow. It's, it's hey, been a while. This is like, you know, give the ball to Jordan. Actually, give the ball to Caitlin. Everyone else get out of the way. Yeah, I, I felt it tonight. You know, Chris Chris and Maddie, they were, you know, they got young kids. They're taking care of them. Like, I'm going live. We're doing this. It's been a long time. I'm pumped up. I got to go run around the house after this is over to get rid of my energy before I sit on the couch and watch another amazing women's college basketball game. So those of you who are watching live, why don't you go do that too? Those of you who listen to this, we appreciate you doing that to each and every one of the programs on the Iowa Every Nowhere Network. And one more time, definitely want to uh, thank our presenting sponsor, Wild Rose Casinos with locations in Jefferson, Iowa, Emmitsburg, Iowa, and Clinton, Iowa. And, you know, I got a funny feeling that it's possible that in a year from now, you might even see some Cardinal and gold in a position like this because Iowa state women are going to be loaded. And what, I mean, it's been a great run for the state of Iowa as far as amazing talent in the women's game, Iowa state 
fans know that they've they've been there. Uh, they 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 achieved higher heights than the Iowa program did. Iowa now it's their turn. Flipping back to Iowa State, it'd be great here in a couple two three years. Aiden, Iowa and Iowa State both in the top ten, both battling out, both getting to a Final Four. That would be so so That'd good. Be awesome. That would be great. All right for Aiden. I'm John Miller. We'll talk to you next time on the Iowa Everywhere Network.